All right, I think now it's time uh, to start the panel. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Format 37. And this is the second virtual room of today's panel titled Causal Inference. Thank you for joining this panel. I'm Kenichi Ariga uh, from the University of Toronto, uh, who is going to chair this panel. I'm joined by our co-host, Ileida Onder from the Penn State University, who is assisting the panel on technical aspects. We will feature two exciting presentations in, in this panel. Each presentation will be 20 minutes long, followed by 10 minutes of discussion and comments, and 15 minutes of a Q&A session. During the Q&A session, please use the raise hand function of Zoom. Then we will unmute you and invite you to speak. So let's start with the first presentation. The first presentation is by Justin Easley on the paper co-authored with Scott DeMarchi and Joseph K. Young. The paper is titled, Causal Inference or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Hypothesis Testing. Justin, over to you. Um, please uh, start your presentation. Can uh, everybody see the uh, slides and hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Justin. I do this all the time for the IMC, but I have to say it's a lot different to be doing it uh, as the presenter. It's more fun being the moderator. Um, as, as, uh, uh, as was mentioned, um, this is co-authored work with Joe Young, who's also here today, and Scott DeMarkey, uh, who is not here today, um, a professor at Duke. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, the title is, uh, is Deliberate. Um, uh, I'm, I'm maybe doing a little bit of search engine optimization uh, on people who mistype causal for casual. Um, and, and it also is a pun, which I hope will come uh, uh, apparent as we go through. Uh, I want to mention also this is a, a, an active project, so we're definitely still uh, hoping for feedback. Um, and I, I hope uh, we'll have a good discussion, some good comments from Luke, and, and be able to improve our project uh, after this presentation. I want to start out by just saying three things uh, that we are saying and then a couple of things we're not saying uh, because I believe it's going to be especially important to clarify precisely what we're hoping you take away from this talk. So here are three things we hope you'll take away from this talk. Uh, the first one is that SUTVA, the single unit treatment value assumption, uh, does not apply. Uh, to data generated from strategic interaction, that is to say, games. Um, and that's really important because the Rubin and Pearl causal models that underlie design-based inference um, rely on Sattva. And so if you don't get Sattva, you have problems. So we'll talk about why that's true. Uh, calculation of meaningful treatment effects in a strategic game requires prior knowledge of the game structure, which is typically not available. Averaging over multiple types of games produces an incoherent finding. So what we mean here is it is in some cases possible uh, to calculate uh, a version of an average treatment effect of a kind, uh, but that um, treatment effect will not, uh, uh, it will be misleading or uh, even, and can even be wrong. Um, and if you just try to average over uh, a bunch of different kinds of games that you don't understand, you're going to get that kind of weird finding. So in order to really get um, the causal inferences you would want to get out of this situation, you have to know what the game looks like in advance. And that's a bit of a problem because we're doing research precisely because we don't know what the situation is. And then for the two reasons above, even the strongest research design, so uh, you know, experimentation with randomized assignment to treatment, is gonna produce a, an incorrect or misleading causal inference from data generated from strategic games when interpreted by the Rubin Pearl model. And this does not mean experiments are broken or wrong or something. It just means that um, they, in, they produce an estimand which is uh, problematic um, for any meaningful purpose once they're applied to this kind of data. And in so much that um, strategic interaction characterizes most or, or even maybe all of what we study in politics and economics, that's a problem for applying the Rubin Pearl model to, to these kind of data. Um, I also want to point out that uh, we're not going to go down the road of saying you ought to uh, estimate a structural model a la the EITM framework um, that, was, uh, that was sort of um, 
uh, popular in the in the early 2000s was begun in some ways by McKelvey and Palfrey, carried forward by Signorino and lots of other people, including me. Um, those structural models actually have uh, similar weaknesses. And so just saying, oh, you should write down the game and then estimate the parameters on that game, that's, we're not, so we're not saying that. Here's what we're not saying. Uh, the problems highlighted in our paper will be solved by our new estimator software package or causal inference model. Uh, I know a lot of methods talks are like that. Um, ours is not. Um, instead, we're arguing that causal relationships are, are objects of theory. They are noumenal in, uh, if you're a philosophy buff. Um, and uh, as such, we cannot read them directly off of data. They don't exist in a way we can access in data. And this is what we mean when we say there is no causation without explanation. Uh, causality is uh, a causal relationship is something that exists in theory. And we don't uh, prove it true or false generally. Um, it may actually be true or false, but we don't, we can't access that information. Uh, Tara Slow makes an, a, a related point um, in a, a recent paper of hers, uh, which we've cited in our paper. Um, although we take it, I think, considerably further uh, than, than she does in applying it to a broader case of, uh, a broader set of cases. Um, we're also not saying uh, everything you know is wrong or causal inference research design should be discredited or whatever. We're not saying any, we're not saying that. Um, obviously, all research designs have weaknesses or, or, or weak points, flaws. That's not what we're here to talk about, nor do we think that we are going to convince you that, you know, RDD or experimentation or whatever is bad. Um, what we're, all those things are still going to be uh, in your toolkit if you believe what we are saying. Um, and I'm certainly going to continue to use them. What we're really talking about is um, interpretation. And in addition to that, um, we still need those designs to rule out rival explanations, rival causes like confounding and simultaneity. So we're not, um, this is not some sort of throw everything out you know. Um, it's rather about how we use the, a, a different way of using those tools, a different way of thinking about those tools, and um, a changing, uh, in some ways, the project that we're engaged in as, as uh, social scientists and political scientists. So let's start with the first argument, uh, Sattva does not apply. So here's a very simple game. We're using this very simple game uh, because if we find problems with sattva in this very simple game, uh, that is going to uh, be uh, concerning. Um, and so um, in this setting, we are treating uh, the treatment condition as the vector of payoffs that correspond to those entries in the, in the two-player simultaneous uh, move game that we're depicting there. Um, we could have included other stuff in the treatment condition like the structure of the game, action sequences, information sets, or whatever. Nothing about what we're going to say is, is going to change if we do that. We, we just did it this way for simplicity and because it maps on to the idea of um, when we think about matching or random assignment, we think about um, balancing on uh, parameters or, or, or measured variables and, and these payoff parameters kind of map on nicely to that. Two points we're going to make. The first one is if you change a payoff such as alpha i by intervening uh, with a treatment, uh, the effect of doing that is going to depend on the other player's vector of payoff. So that is to say the other player's treatment. That is um, definitionally a violation of sattva because uh, there should be no dependence between uh, what a treatment does to me and what someone else's treatment uh, condition is if sattva holds. There's also a second uh, version of sattva violation here, which is that um, changes in my vector, my treatment vector, um, alpha i in this case as an example, um, has uh, often has an effect on the other player's behavior. And in fact, it may have no effect on my behavior at all, but, it, but, it ha but some um, a powerful effect on another player's behavior. That's also a violation of sattva because uh, we have a case where my treatment is impacting somebody else, but not really me. Uh, so to illustrate this, I've, I've basically filled in the blanks for some of these payoffs. So you can see two examples of two different games with the same structure and the same information sets. 
Uh, one of them is a sort of asymmetric hawk dove game. The other one is a matching pennies game. So if I were to um, add a large uh, positive addition to um, the payoff uh, for uh, player one uh, it, under the action profile alpha or A1, A2. Uh, what that would do is it would um, uh, raise the probability of, prob of, of uh, that you shift to that equilibrium A1, A2 as long as the addition is big enough, right? So in other words, you can make that, um, that option more attractive to player one and, and they shift to it. Uh, by contrast, in the matching pennies game, where the other player uh, faces a different set of incentives, um, th that, that intervention has no effect at all on player one, um, because the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium that, uh, that is unique in that game, um, it will not change um, for player one's actions, at least, when player one's payoffs are, are affected. Only player two uh, uh, is going to change their behavior, and they have to do that to maintain player one's indifference to both of their actions. So uh, here we've got two games that are similar in structure, but because the treatment vectors are different, um, we see both set of violations in action, right? We see a case where changes to player one's payoffs change player two. Uh, we also see cases where uh, um, the vector of another player's treatment conditions uh, and also my own treatment, other treatment conditions, changes the effect of the treatment on my behavior, right? It can be positive or it can be zero. Um, and again, these are simple games. Uh, maybe you want a more complicated game. Um, here's a Rubenstein bargaining model. This is um, a, a model that underlies a lot of work in, uh, legis in legislative bargaining, uh, deal making, and in, in international conflict, among others. Um, you can find the same sorts of sub violations in this game. Um, specifically, um, if you change one player's patience factor, that is going to change um, uh, the behavior of another player, right? So if you change, uh, I think it's Zeta 2, that's player 2's patience factor, player 1 is actually going to change their offer X in equilibrium. So player 2 is, is not really affected. Um, their off path action, or not off path, but their uh, later in the tree actions you don't observe are, are they are affected, but you never actually see that in the data if if the equilibrium holds. But you do see changes in player one's behavior. Player two is going to is going to accept either way, so their behavior doesn't change in the observed equilibrium. So there's a more complicated game where you see the same problems. So I hope that that is enough to convince you that sattva. Uh, even in very simple controlled scenarios, it is fragile. And if sattva is fragile, um, the Rubin Pearl uh, modality of calculating, for example, average treatment effects and the interpretation of those effects that, that relies on the Rubin Pearl model um, is going to be um, uh, flawed. It's going to be misleading. Uh, the second thing I want to uh, argue is that you need to know something about the game in order to interpret. Um, a finding. And so here's an example of a coordination game that has three different Nash equilibria, uh, two peer strategy and one mixed strategy. Um, this is uh, the old battle of the sexes game, uh, if you remember having some unpleasant memories from undergraduate game theory. Um, and if I were to increase the payoff for player one, to the action uh, A1, A2 right here, so if I were to, to increase that payoff, um, that would weakly decrease the probability that alpha two gets played. It doesn't have any impact in the pure strategy Nash equilibria, but in the mixed strategy Nash equilibria, it increases the probability that player two plays B2. So it's not the violation, but that's not really what we're focused on right here. Um, if we were to try to apply our typical identification strategies to such a game, we would run into problems because we would um, be comparing games that are in every way identical structurally and in payoffs and in information sets and everything, but the behavior in those games can be different in when facing the exact same um, uh, incentive structure. And so, um, for example, if you have a treatment condition uh, or a treatment case that's playing the pure strategy Nash, one of the pure strategy Nash equilibria, and you compare that to another treatment case that's playing a different pure strategy Nash equilibria, you're gonna get an apparent quote unquote treatment effect, even though it actually, there is no effect at all. Um, you're just comparing two different equilibria, 
um, it can make it look like there are treatment effects that aren't actually there, uh, which is a big problem, for example, if you're trying to match on observables or do diff and diff, because you might be comparing uh, cases that superficially look the same but are actually not. And you can come up with, um, in the paper we show you, you can actually get a lot of different answers, almost any possible answer out of this comparison. Now, maybe what we could do is uh, do random assignment or, or some version of it like instrumental variables and average over uh, lots of different comparisons between lots of different games. There are going to be six possible comparisons you can make in this sort of game because there are three equilibria you're comparing two um, uh, pairs of them. Are you comparing multiple pairs of them? Half of those comparisons are going to be misleading. So at an absolute minimum, you're going to just be introducing quite a lot of noise um, to your comparison. But it's also going to be true that um, whatever effect you estimate, it is causal in a sense, um, because whatever treatment you apply did cause the difference. Um, that effect you estimate will not generalize to another population if they're playing a different mix of equilibria. So if you, just as a trivial example, if you um, do some experiments or something and, and you look at a treatment effect among a bunch of people playing the mixed strategy, Nash Equilibria, that's not going to tell you much about what the effect of that treatment would be in a population if they're mostly playing one of the pure strategy, Nash Equilibria. So uh, we end up either comparing apparently similar games that aren't really the same, or we uh, average over a bunch of different comparisons and the result is, is, is at best fragile. Um, and it, it tells you very little about what's actually happening in terms of how the intervention changes people's incentives. Uh, this, of course, gets even worse if you start thinking about games that might look observationally equivalent but are not. So here are two games. One is incomplete information. One is complete information. Payoffs are the same. Actions are the same. Um, maybe you can measure the uh, presence or absence of an information set. Um, if you can, that means it's going to be a super moderator, meaning it's going to change the impact. It's been basically going to change the impact of any intervention you have on the game. Uh, worst case scenario, you can't directly measure what that information set, uh, what the information structure of the game looks like. And now you're comparing games that are really quite different. So if you match these games, or if you try to average over, you know, the treatment effect in a bunch of these games, who you know, who knows what comes out. So uh, this all leads to our, our core argument that if you believe what we said before, where you end up is even the strongest research designs are going to produce incorrect or misleading inferences uh, when you um, apply uh, the Rubin Pearl uh, framework to that data. And so just to summarize what we're trying to say here, if C is a causal relationship, and E is an empirical pattern that is predicted by that relationship, so C implies the, the pattern. Um, just showing that E is true does not allow us to infer that C is true, right? So that's a false uh, syllogism. Um, so uh, you can't say C implies E and I saw E, therefore C. That doesn't work, right? That's an, uh, 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 an incorrect inference. What Ruben Pearl does is it adds a bunch of assumptions, which hopefully we think are, are mild, and under those assumptions, A, uh, we can argue that A implies that E implies C. So in other words, if A is true, then if we see E, we know C is true. That's the sort of abstract version of it. And what you do when you're drawing an inference is you say, well, I'm assuming um, A, right? I stipulate the assumptions of the Rubin Pearl model. Those uh, assumptions imply E implies C, and then I see E. Right, I see the empirical pattern, therefore I draw a causal inference. Um, and our paper is basically trying to convince you for that for a strategic game, gamma, gamma implies not A. So that doesn't work anymore. Um, and I have to jump in here quickly to say, yeah, we could start looking for a new set of assumptions, A prime, like we could um, write down an extensive form model a la Signorino um, or, or the later deriva uh, comparative static-based derivations by um, Karuba, Zen, and Yorn, uh, Karuba, Zorn, and uh, Yuan, or, or whatever, um, those probably aren't going to work either for the same exact reason, right? Because if the assumptions are wrong, the logic breaks just as it breaks uh, here. Um, so we have a couple of examples. I'm running a little short on time. I've only got about two and a half minutes left, so I'm going to go through them very quickly so I can get to my conclusion. Um, one of our examples pertains to the analysis of um, primaries, 
and what happens when an extremist wins a primary. And um, in this uh, analysis, which uses regression discontinuity design, uh, we are concerned that the population of um, extremists that very uh, narrowly win or lose elections is not really representative of the population of extremists in general because most comp primary elections are not competitive. And that means the strategic incentives that these candidates face are quite different. So finding that in a very competitive primary, the extremist candidate loses um, doesn't necessarily generalize uh, to, to the larger population of, of relatively safe primary districts. Another example we have is um, from Ritter and Conrad, who are trying to use rainfall as an instrument for protest activity to determine how protests influence government repression. Um, the issue we uh, raise here is that rainfall might not have a uniform effect on all kinds of protests. So uh, rainfall doesn't uh, deter the, the hardest core uh, protesters. It deters uh, smaller and uh, smaller protests and less intense protests. The, um, uh, the government doesn't necessarily care about deterring those anyway. Um, ergo, uh, it had, you know, we, we can have a, a problem there. Um, and there's a sub of violation if protests are coordinated regionally, which we know they often are. So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, we're skeptical of the sorts of assumptions that will unlock causal inference. And instead, we think we should just treat causal relationships as theory and say that there's no causation without explanation. Um, uh, causal relationships are objects of theory whose truth status is unknown. Uh, and instead, what we should do is um, predict empirical patterns that we observe if we believe that certain causal relationships are true, look for the presence or absence of those empirical patterns, and then use research design to rule out alternative causal explanations or rival causes, right? So we specify a design D, D implies that C prime, an alternative assumption, an uh, alternative explanation is not true. Um, and also that we introduce this concept of Nash balancing, which examines the equilibrium behavior of sample versus population, because we need to have a match in order for generalization to happen. I'm over my time. I, I just want to say I really uh, am interested to hear your feedback, and thanks for uh, being attentive. Thank you, Justin, for your presentation. The discussant for this paper is Luke Keel. Uh, Luke, uh, can you please start sharing your screen and offer your comments? <sighs> uh, let me know if anything doesn't seem to be right. Uh, thanks, Justin, for that interesting paper. Um, so essentially, this is the paper is an argument in three parts. And my, I don't like to do tons of summary on papers, but um, essentially, the argument is strategic interactions lead to central violations. Inferences require prior theoretical knowledge and sound design is, I should say, that's the typo, she's insufficient for causal inference, because that's the way I summarized it. So um, I think part of the problem, the paper has some good points to be made, especially to a particular type of game theory audience, but I think it's trying to do a little too much, and because it's trying to do too much, it overplays its hand in a couple of points, and that's gonna be my general critique, because there's a bit of overreach here. So, for example, the papers, or the paper as in, in the presentation, this was quite clear. The authors make this point about central violations, but they very strongly, I would say, overstate the consequence of a central violation. So, for example, there is a paper, this is a quote from the paper. When stuff is violated, estimates of the causal impact of the treatment will be fragile, variable, or difficult to generalize outside the sample. And they sort of, what they call the Rubin Pearl model, which are good different models, but anyway, basically can't deal with subval violations, right? There's this clearer sense that a subval violation is fatal, end of story, we're, we're done. Subval violation, go home. But we can actually, subval violations are, I wouldn't say not a problem, but totally accommodated. Uh, for example, even in the presence of a separate violation, the sharp null is still out, right? That's something that we can learn. There is actually, I would say, I wouldn't, 
I hesitate to say this is the most active area of work in causal inference, but it is a very active part of causal inference, is focusing on essentially how you deal with central violations. Um, central violations essentially impose some different structure, but even there's a lot of work on showing what you can learn without imposing structure. In many of these sort of game type situations, if you impose structure on what you think the spillover were, there's lots of different sorts of progresses, progress could be made. And this literature in statistics that focuses on set violation focuses on many different forms of social networks um, that are, I would say, as, as intractable as any sort of strategic interaction setting that you might find in social science. So, which isn't to say that they don't have a valid point. I think you could easily take this part of the paper and say, Several violations show up because of interactions. Here's what you could do about it instead of saying, oh, stop, uh, end of story. There's also really large literature on strategic games and in experiments. There's a big parts of econ and other parts of political science where they essentially use experimental design in conjunction with a uh, 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 strategic interaction. Um, which isn't to say that that literature is, doesn't always get stuff all right, but they clearly thought about it. And it seems like that this literature is another literature that should be interacted with on this particular point. So, um, so that's, that was argument one. And the arguments aren't totally separate from each other, but there's somewhat different arguments. And uh, so they have this second argument about prior theoretical knowledge. And the way I would summarize this middle section of the paper is that a deeper understanding of the empirical process, in this case, the games, but I think this could be true outside of that setting, can lead to valid causal inferences. They essentially walk through a setting where if you know a lot about what's going on, you can get the right answer, which is all a perfectly valid point. I think that's a point many would endorse. As I said, it's a fine sentiment, but it's one that's been made elsewhere quite a few times. And I think is generally uncontroversial. Um, that isn't a reason not to repeat the argument. Uh, this is an argument people like to ignore. But in, in political science, you can find short examples of these kind of arguments by me, but also by Thad Dunning, Jason C. Wright. But all of this stuff is, I think, really building off uh, arguments best made by Paul Rosenbaum in a paper about what he calls thick description, which is what he calls is essentially what he calls thick description is a descriptive enterprise of the medical setting, but they essentially follow doctors around and see how they're using charts. Because in medical settings, what gets written in the chart is what turns into your variables um, that you would later control for. And there's a nice little uh, case study essentially of how when you follow the doctor around and get a sense of the way they're entering the data, you might change the way you control the things. Um, which is again, this idea that I think deep empirical knowledge is, is often quite valuable. Um, so I think that's a very sign, fine point for them to make, but they should situate the, that point, I think, a, a bit better. Um, they have two critiques of existing studies. One is rather long and one is quite short. I think that's probably more a function of just sort of trying to finish the paper. Um, but don't have a ton to say. That was the other section there that I don't have a ton to say. So their conclusion, how much you summarize what these three somewhat related arguments uh, uh, state is, so this is a quote, we, were, we argue for a return to hypothesis testing that requires a specification of a theoretical model, the derivation of their empirical traditions, prior to settling on an identification strategy. Which is, I think, a very nice sentiment. It would be very nice if we could compare, if, if science could sort of com, com easily compartmentalized in this, in this particular way, especially in a way that was observable to everybody so that we know, knew that uh, nobody was cheating, so to speak. Essentially, that's, you could argue, they, another point that they could be arguing is they're making an argument for uh, research registration analysis plans. Those are sort of what they're doing. That's a typically a registration of an identification strategy, not a theory. You could maybe do a step back and make people register their theories before they register their identification strategy, though that's still not gonna give what you want because most of the point at which that's posted is observable. But I think it's also kind of a, a, a little, it, it would be nice if we could if our ideas work that way, but I think it's a little too simple in the sense that it's, it's a nice idea, but the process is messy, right? We have ideas, which are roughly what theories are, 
we look at data and we change our ideas, right? The data is always surprising. And as you get into data, you change your ideas. Uh, strictly speaking, I think under their world, you would have to come up with a theory before you ever cleaned your data, because I know from my experience, cleaning data changes how I think about the project. Um, so there's, it's always going to be some sort of iterative process where the, 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 the ideas and the data interact in a particular way. Does that mean sometimes it leads to some sort of hacking, perhaps, but I don't really know how else to do that. Um, moreover, I think because it's iterative, not just within a single paper, but across lots of papers, right? If we find an experiment with absolutely no theory and find something to work, is, is that problematic if someone else comes along and then fills in the theory or comes along? That's essentially how most of the history of medicine has worked. Uh, I, the first use of vaccines, they noticed, right, that uh, certain people who milk cows didn't get smallpox. Right, it was 50 years later before they figured out why, because they knew that the germ theory was quite new. Um, but if you, one thing I think that it has, this happens is if we do have a good identification strategy, we actually believe that to be a fact worth explaining, opposed to a fact that it's probably a function of a million different kinds of biases. Um, I think the bigger problem, right, so there's always going to be some iteration here, and if someone thinks your theory is inadequate, they can always come along do a better explanation, come up with a new research design. I think personally the bigger problem is we feel like we have to come up with new theories all the time instead of taking the time to repeatedly test the same theories over again. Uh, that's my particular uh, axe to grind. I said that in a paper once. Uh, I haven't really come back to it. Um, so overall, I think, that, I think that this paper has some good ideas that could be fleshed out, especially for a game theory audience, particularly argument one. Um, but I also think it needs to A, engage with the literature more broadly outside of political science, and come to terms with the fact that, you know, this research process is messy and it's, it's very hard to do in some sort of hermetic environment where the theory is sealed from the identification strategy, which is then sealed from the results. Um, and those are my, that's those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Luke, for your comments. Well, uh, the next is a Q&A session. Uh, but while uh, participants are thinking about uh, their questions, I want to ask the authors if they have any quick response to the points raised by uh, Luke. Um, so meanwhile, please press the raise hand icon of Zoom if you have questions. Justin and George, uh, do you have any quick response? Yes. Um, so uh, I'll just mention two things to keep it brief. Um, it is possible to come to conclusions from strategic data. You mentioned um, experimental design. I published uh, quite a few papers that uh, use experiments to um, recover information from strategic interactions. So of course, I, I know that's possible. I'm, I'm in print saying it. Um, but I don't think that that process involved um, the uh, design-based um, treating, treating uh, findings uh, estimated out of an uh, average treatment effect um, as being facts. You mentioned in your response, um, you know, causal inference uh, research designs make it possible to treat findings as facts, right? So vaccines cause uh, smallpox to not occur. Um, even though we don't know why. In that case, sure, it worked. Um, it, we got lucky. Um, I, I do not believe, however, that just showing that um, you inject somebody with, uh, with cowpox and therefore they, uh, they develop immunity to smallpox, um, it tells us something in that pretty narrow case but it doesn't really tell us anything about that, that, uh, that we can use outside that narrow case. And we got lucky in the sense that that particular inoculation didn't have um, spillover effects or didn't have um, uh, lots of treatment heterogeneity problems. And of course, it's not a strategic um, a case. Uh, we're not playing games with viruses. So in, in, in the case of medicine, I'm actually not sure I would want to use medicine as an example since medicine is a graveyard of bad ideas, but, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not convinced their scientific process is producing 
um, uh, uh, lots of good stuff all the time. They produce tons and tons of stuff, a small sliver of which ends up being very valuable, most of which ends up being garbage. So it's, that's not something I'd want to appeal to. Um, but I do think um, we're, you're absolutely right in saying that we need to illustrate um, how this can be done, uh, what we mean specifically can, should be done differently. And we're hoping to develop um, uh, the, the uh, applications in that way. And I, I would be open to also talking specifically about uh, in the example of experiments, um, what we are recommending would be different from um, just calculating ATEs or, or, or using a, a Rubin model. Oh, also one more thing, Pearl thinks the Rubin and Pearl models are the same, so you can argue with him. <laughs> uh, one quick counterpoint is roughly, I would say anyone who uses experimental design in this camp would be covered under design-based inference because an experiment is by definition designed. And you sound very skeptical in medicine. I work in a hospital. They make it, sure there are a lot of bad papers that come out of medicine, but trust me, they there's a lot of great work that anyway. Well, they put so much money and so there's so much effort in it that yeah, like if five percent of what goes into the NIH produces good work, that's still a lot. Um, but but I'm not convinced that their their process is uh well, there's a literature um that's 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 long about the fact that a lot of what's in medicine is not great. Um, and so, yeah, they've, they've had some successes, um, probably better successes than we have actually definitely better successes than we have. Um, but they have a uh, hundred times the budget and they've been doing it for 10 times as long. So we'll see where we are in, if the NSF starts funding us at the level of, you know, $20 billion a year for the next hundred years. All right, so now I want to take a question from the floor. Uh, the first question is from Ye Wang. Uh, hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, terrific. Uh, Justin, I think that's a fascinating paper and I completely agree with your point that uh, we need more interpretation uh, in causal inference. But I think uh, some of uh, your arguments are still debatable. Uh, so I have two comments or questions on, on your presentation. I think my first question is whether you are trying to advocate uh, structural estimation in political science as you know, economists have been doing uh, in the past decades. So if so, I think, uh, as you know, structural estimation has its own problems. The first is that there are many questions of interest cannot be really studied by structural approaches. Like uh, in political psychology, people are interested in how a certain emotion can change political behavior, and that can hardly be modeled. And uh, the second problem is that even you are using structural estimation, you still need to rely on uh, some natural experiment to, to identify your moment conditions. So it's, it's quite difficult to argue that structural estimation can produce more convincing results uh, without a natural experiment. Uh, so that's my first comment. And the second comment is like, I'm working on cause inference uh, uh, when Sutwa fails with interference or spillover. I think, uh, you know, Luca has mentioned a little bit, but I think uh, uh, from my uh, point of view, the current practice in this literature is to con consider the expected average treatment effect, which means like in your two by two game, like the sex battle, we fix the behavior of player B at its expectation and we consider what will happen to the behavior of player A uh, after the treatment is imposed. And then it will have a quite different uh, uh, explanation, I think. So it can uh, somehow avoid the problem uh, you just mentioned. Uh, so that's my second comment. Thank you. We are definitely not advocating for structural estimation in the sense that um, one specifies a theory which implies a strict um, uh, econometric model and then you estimate parameters. The problem with that is the assumptions that go into that model are, are just as, um, they're, they're assumptions just like the assumptions over the Rubin model and the Perl model. Um, and so um, they're gonna, you can attack them in the same way. I think uh, instead, I, I don't necessarily think in terms of model specification, um, there needs to be a ton of difference, but I do think that 
um, in terms of de developing measures, in terms of identifying appropriate subsets, uh, identifying the uh, research design that's going to circumvent some of the problems as best we can. Um, that's where the that's where I think the difference is. So, for example, in in economic experiments, we you know one thing that happens in economic experiments is we know the game, and we know. Um, uh, specifically, um, what everyone's incentives are, what the equilibrium should be, and so on. Equilibria should be. Uh, even then, actually, though, it turns out we don't really know the game because um, very often people bring in their own payoffs and their own ideas and their own um, beliefs, and so they don't necessarily do, quote unquote, what they're supposed to do. And so the um, it, that that is what happens, right? You make predictions, you run an experiment, you see that the predictions are not met. And then you go back to the drawing board and say, well, okay, you know, what can explain these, these anomalies? You make a new theory and then you derive new predictions and test those predictions, right? This is how you come up with things like the fairness uh, based um, uh, utility models of uh, Ernst Fair and um, I'm blanking on the other guy's name. Um, that's how that happened. Um, but it's not about a structural model. A structural model was not really involved. Um, in terms of uh, the expected ATE and fixing player B's behavior, player two's behavior, well, that's just it. You can't do that in a strategic game. Um, you can't fix player two's behavior because player two is reacting to the treatment. Um, and so um, maybe you could find some way of doing that in a very controlled environment. But if you're trying to, for example, conduct a field experiment, um, there's just no way of, of doing that. And in fact, fixing player B's behavior wouldn't necessarily fix the equilibrium. Um, it, it would depend on exactly what the set of equilibria possibilities were. Right. Uh, the next question is from Tara. Hey, um, can you? We heard you at first and then something happened. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Thanks. Uh, thanks for this paper. Uh, it's exciting work. So I think I have sort of two questions or comments. I'm not really sure what they are. So the first is, um, you, as I understand from the presentation, you're equating sort of strategic interaction with SUTPA violations. And I, I don't think that that's a general claim. And the reason is as such. So you could think of if you had in your games player one being in treatment, player two being in control, you're absolutely right. But imagine if we treated the two players as a cluster. Right. And in that case, we don't have a super violation unless we're worried about other clusters of two players interacting. And I think that's generally what we do in field experiments when we do like village level development treatments in wherever in the world we do these like community driven development. We think there's a lot of strategic interaction. We're just trying to say that we're assigning at the uh, village level and th those strategic interactions are going to happen within the village. And then SUPA is not uh, necessarily violated. Um, and so I had a question about how general your claim is there. And then the second thing is, I think one of the problems you bring up in the second point, which I agree with, is that a lot of sort of theoretic predictions may be non-falsifiable using whatever standard um, estimates or standard research designs. And so I guess I'm a little bit confused about how we get to this uh, sort of exclusion of rival explanations if many rival explanations similarly are non-falsifiable with the research designs we're using. So I'm wondering how you're sort of going from A to B there. Thanks. Uh, to the first point, cluster level treatments. Yes, this is the, that's the canonical solution to um, SUPTA that Luke was mentioning, right? So you can um, redefine what the treatment is, right? And you can redefine um, what the, um, what the uh, unit of analysis is in such a way that um, the groups can't interact, right? So um, there may be some cases where if you had uh, prior knowledge of the game, um, which is the second point we were making, you might be able to accomplish that. Um, but in order to, um, to justify that, you're going to have to stipulate um, that the game has a certain sort of structure, that the treatment has a certain kind of effect, um, and it doesn't necessarily um, work if the group level is still composed of a bunch of different heterogeneous um, game interactions and you're applying a treatment to all of them. You'll get a valid ATE in the sense of you can conclude this blunt treatment did cause this observed change in behavior, 
but when you're going to, you could be averaging over many different um, uh, uh, micro level um, effects that are going on. And so the um, theoretical import and generalizability of the, of that conclusion, I think is going to be suspect unless you can claim that the, um, the uh, population to which you wish to generalize is, is exactly the same, um, which, and is unchanging, right? It's not changing over time. Um, and so I, th there are, um, as you point out in your paper, Tara, there are these embedded assumptions um, that, that get smuggled in. Um, and we're, we're trying to point out that those are questionable. So yeah, you can overcome stuff that way, but I'm not sure you actually have gotten yourself out of the trap. Um, the other thing you said is uh, theoretical predictions being non-falsifiable. Yeah, I mean, if you if you take a, a Lakatosian perspective, you're never gonna you're never gonna disprove somebody's uh, favorite theory because um, you can always adjust ancillary assumptions to make it survive. Um, but I do think that um, there there is such a thing as scientific progress. Um, to bring up something Luke said earlier, we have seen that medicine today is better than medicine in the 1860s. I'm not totally convinced that that's because their process is awesome, but I do think we have seen progress. Uh, and I think that that progress has come by discarding certain ideas that turned out to be very bad, even though their proponents didn't necessarily ever admit they were wrong. So, um, there are always going to be undecidable questions. There are always going to be, uh, it's going to be impossible to convince the hardest core um, uh, proponent of something that they're wrong. But I don't think that means that in the greater scheme of things that w we can't make progress by demonstrating, look, the predictions of this theory just don't, just don't fly.